Hello. All right. We're going to get going with our next session here. We've got Nate Beck and Jeremy Sines. They're going to talk about using Stage 3D to do some test driving, so this should be fairly entertaining. Take it away, guys. All right. Is that a good level? Jeremy, your yes. mic. Hello. Can everybody hear me? So, and I guess, right. I guess me and Jeremy are going to have to be real close up here, because I guess the camera doesn't really move. Yeah, we're going to cuddle a little bit, but so, uh, so don't feel uncomfortable, guys. <laughs> so, uh, this is test driving. It was originally called driving stage 3D, but we decided to throw the word test in there mostly because um, this was our first uh, production level stage 3D app. I mean, a lot of us have written uh, tech demos and all kinds of things on mobile and, and all of that. And this was really our first attempt as you know, an actual product and a lot of the issues that uh, we ran into doing it on you know, uh, with that kind of level of polish that we needed. So to kick us off, uh, I'm Nate Beck. I am a co-founder and chief paper pusher for the engine company. Um, I am a father. Uh, I like to hack things. Most recently, it's been uh, the Spiro. Has anyone seen the really cool Spiro robotics thing? I think it's awesome. Fun to hack on. Uh, and I make a really killer Pico de guy. I'm originally from Phoenix. Um, and of course, I have to show the obligatory baby picture. Um, I figure teach them young. So you should enjoy this. All right. Um, I'm Jeremy Stein. Founder and principal architect at Lido Studios. Um, I'm also uh, a rapper, so I have I'm able to call myself a gangsta uh, hacker, and I wear kind of cool glasses. Yeah, it's really funny because his glasses are transitional lenses. So they're probably going to transition with the lights. It'll too. look like he's wearing shades inside. Yeah, we'll so you can, you can mock him for that. So real quick uh, disclaimer here: um, we're going to be quite sarcastic. In our, uh, in our presentation. Um, and, and the reason for that is because what we're going to be discussing is a physical driving game that we actually did uh, for a client that was installed at the Detroit Auto Show. Um, I think the legal way I can say this is we did a lot of work for a large automotive manufacturer who will remain nameless throughout the uh, entire uh, presentation. Well, that's not entirely true. They will not re remain nameless. Um, well, let's see. For the duration of this talk, let's just call our company Vroom Motors. So as far as the thing, we're going to talk about our client Vroom through the duration um, of this presentation. So Vroom has asked us to kind of put in a little plug for their, their new offering that they have. That's how we get paid to be here. Exactly. So I'll just start us off. Vroom represents the pinnacle in automotive design, an automobile for the next generation. And we're very, very excited to announce their flagship product, the 2013 Vroombox Eco. With its sleek design and shiny red paint job, it's fantastic. That's right, that's right. Also, one more thing, it comes in thousands of colors. Thousands. Really, you can kind of do whatever you want with it. It's like slapping an image on a box or something. Yep. It's fantastic. On a more serious note, all of our demos and screenshots will be featuring the Vroombox. Um, the Vroombox Eco. The Vroombox Eco. Very important. Um, as, as the car that we'll be driving around. Absolutely. So here's what we actually built. Um, we didn't actually build the enclosure, but we did all the software for this. But this is a physical arcade style game with a steering wheel and you know pedal system uh, that we did. And Vroom came to us and basically asked if we could build uh, kind of an engaging, uh, fun experience. Other other major automotive manufacturers also had kind of steering wheel style games. I, I guess you could call them games. They weren't really, they're more like driving simulators. And they um, were very, very boring. Um, just going into the booth, it didn't even, like, it made you want to walk away from the booth. It was, they, they wanted to teach you to drive economically, so it's like, drive really slowly and then accelerate break, slowly, break accelerate slowly. slowly, break slowly. And so it, it wasn't really like the fun kind of gamey attitude that um, Room wanted to communicate to its to the people going into its booth. 
Yeah, and so we actually had the opportunity to go to, this was installed at the Detroit Auto Show, but we had an opportunity to go see the LA Auto Show and actually look at, um, kind of see how people uh, interacted at the LA Auto Show. And we found something quite interesting is that they kind of traveled in packs. It was like a group of people going. And then when they interacted with something at the booth, they actually kind of, you know, they would hover around. So in these other driving games, people would, one person would sit and drive, and then you'd have like five people standing behind them doing absolutely nothing. Uh, so we actually introduced these secondary back screens, um, which while someone is driving, you can actually throw crap at them, like Mario Kart style, yep. um, which kind of introduced uh, a new uh, aspect of play. And it actually increased, one of the big things is we wanted to increase the dwell time at the booth. So instead of having you know, one person going in and playing the game once and being like, okay, that's, that's cool, I guess, or it's all right. Um, we had, you know, a pack of like three people come in and one person would play the game and they'd want to then rotate of who's driving versus who's flinging. We have also scoring and, and pictures to kind of generate that um, competitiveness amongst the packs that were roaming through the auto show. Yep. So, but we don't want to bore you too much with the hardware stuff. What we really want to talk about is the software development, because for us, this was our first installation and hopefully not our last, but, yeah. but we do a lot more software dev, mobile and web-based uh, development. So let's talk about the software that we actually did. So here's a video of the game being played. There is the Broombox Eco. It's quite amazing. Um, but the game is kind of an interesting thing. The, the mechanic of the game is not actually to be, um, the mechanic is not actually to be like a time trial racing type thing, it's, it's about driving economically. So you see in the bottom here, we actually have kind of a rock band style. Um, guitar hero. Rock band, guitar hero. Sure. Sure. Uh, scoring system. Scoring metric. And uh, what happens is as you're driving economically, that score will continue to go up. And each of these leaves acts as a multiplier. So the better you're driving economically, or the better fuel economy you have while you drive, the higher your score will be at the end versus the time you have left. Um, again, this was to make it not a driving simulator, but more like a game. Um, with that, we also had, you saw a couple of orbs that were being thrown um, and colliding. So uh, we'll get into the orbs in just a bit. So uh, the tech behind this, um, we obviously used Flash and the Adobe Air platform to be uh, publishing this. We, we used it for both the, uh, the actual game as well as those back screens. Um, and uh, we used a Wave 3D broomstick, which is the 4.0 version. Um, yeah. When uh, we started this project was back in October of last year. So yeah. it was still in alpha, uh, which was quite interesting to work with. Um, at the time, I think we were some of the, <laughs> we've contributed a lot of code to a Wave 3D since then because yes. of this project. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk a little more about how that was dealing with alpha software. Um, this icon in the middle, you guys probably don't recognize all that much, but um, as a middleware, we used uh, the Smash game engine, game framework, yep. for, uh, for basically our architecture and uh, code organization. It allowed us to really create some clean code. Nate, you'll talk a little yeah, bit Yeah, I'll about talk that. about that. Um, and then the last icon is for those who are not Microsofties. That's actually the logo for Visual Studio. Um, we use C Sharp as kind of a, a way to interact with the actual steering wheel and pedal system uh, as a game controller using direct input. So about Smash, um, for those who are not uh, who are familiar with Push Button Engine, uh, Jeremy and I were both lead contributors on Push Button Engine. Wait, wait, who here is familiar with Push Button Engine? All awesome. right, so we got cool. a few, yeah. And so Jeremy and I kind of worked on that, but unfortunately, about a year ago, Push Button Labs, the company who owned all the rights to PVE, uh, shut down um, and kind of took all of the rights to Push Button Engine with them. With that, so we actually uh, to continue the development on Push Button Engine and to go, we we rebranded as the Smash Game Framework, which you can find uh, there. We actually uh, it, it was a take from Push Button Engine 2, which hadn't really shipped yet, and then basically moved it to Smash, and then have written four or five games on top of that. Yep. And so uh, it's actually a really fantastic architecture that we we utilize. Very nice and clean, and very easy to just get um, started, put it into any kind of game, and re really good for retrofitting, honestly. So uh, if you guys want to find out more about Smash, obviously visit the website, talk to us afterward, and we'll, we'll happily talk, talk about it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, one of the big things that Smash introduced, though, is the, the component entity architecture that it has within there made it really, really easy to switch uh, 
different things like control schemes. Yep. Um, one of the big problems we ran into in the game was the fact that using a steering wheel versus a keyboard is quite different. Uh, if you think of a keyboard, you're either pressing you know, the A or D key to turn left and right. And if you hit A, it's 100% down or 100% not down. Uh, whereas a steering wheel, um, we can go to this one here. So as a steering wheel, you actually have varying degrees. Think of it like a joystick, where you have a varying degree of angle that that can be. So the way you actually control the car with a degree angle versus whether or not the person's pressing left or right is quite different. And so using Smash, we're actually able to um, in Smash, we're actually able to swap different components, whether or not you're using a steering wheel versus a keyboard, uh, and still be able to control the car. Yep. So this is just a little. Uh, photo of me working at the, at the booth doing some debugging. Um, this is kind of just uh, one little note I wanted to bring up is uh, this is our first installation piece. So we, we've done mobile, we've done web, we've done desktop, but we haven't done an installation piece. So you know, part of this postmortem is some of the stuff that we learned from, from doing an installation piece. For instance, us getting there several days before because Murphy's Law definitely comes into play during an installation. And since we're so used to software and software development schedules with Agile and Scrum, it was totally, um, having something totally out of our control like that where things come up, things completely stop working, um, definitely threw a wrench in things. And so we'll talk a little bit about that later, but um, as we go through this hardware section, we'll, we'll kind of hurry through it so we can get to the software side of things. Absolutely. Uh, the one thing to note is you'll notice that the back screen doesn't have, there's normally a white metal cover on the back. Um, one of the problems is that's a really awesome multi-touch monitor but they cut the, the cover too close to the screen. So if the cover was within, uh, if the cover with it was within like two inches above that screen, it would actually act as if someone was touching the screen, making it so it blocked all input, making the screen actually useless. So they, uh, this is the first time we'd actually touched the booth uh, in person. We had all the different pieces, but didn't have the actual enclosure uh, in our office here in Redmond. Um, so, uh, one of the things that I didn't realize, I'd never actually programmed against a steering wheel before, but a steering wheel is basically a joystick. Um, you have different axes that you you look at the, the value. So for example, the pedal, accelerator pedal is, um, is like the Z axis and the steering wheel is on the Y axis. And so you read that data um, like you would a joystick or a game controller. And that's how you get that data. Um, we actually used a C-sharp socket server which read the data and then pumped that into Flash just over a stream um, so that we could actually control the car via that information. Also, a little bit of a side note, this C-sharp server also, um, so basically the game had to run like 12 to 14 hours a day, um, just over and over and over again, so. For a course of like two weeks per auto. Yeah, 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 for a course of about two weeks. Um, so one of the main concerns is obviously like runtime, memory, everything like that, um, which we actually, Work, had a workaround where we had this C-sharp server kind of powering the, the boot up and termination of the air process. Um, and, and a lot of that comes down to the stability wasn't a problem with the platform um, more than we were using alpha software. Absolutely. Um, which may not be bug free at that moment. Yeah, so, so it, was, it was definitely worth uh, making the decision to just boot up the game and close it off every single time rather than try to make something that's near perfect as far as uh, memory and releasing memory. Yeah, and the one thing to note here is you'll see we're using the Logitech G27, which is like high-end consumer grade steering wheel. Um, but unfortunately, uh, Vroom was not convinced that that would actually last for three years. So they gave us this, um, which is actually a steering wheel that they use in NASCAR simulators. This thing is absolutely industrial in every means yeah. of the world. And uh, so one last aside with uh, hardware, and we'll jump into the software stuff, is the fact that I don't know, have, as a nerd, I have a really hard time going into Home Depot, but because this stuff is really industrial, like we actually had to go get like a two by four so we could attach this thing to our Ikea desk at the office. Um, so yeah, that was, there was a lot was of learning process funny. just working with that. Here's some of our machines, just to basically go over it really quick, we use two Mac minis um, to power the uh, back screens as well as this big BP machine here. So here's just a shot of also, this beautiful, beautiful screen, uh, LED, Samsung LED that yeah, it was, uh, they purchased. So basically, the driver has like a 46-inch screen right in front of their face, and it's gorgeous. So that's all we're going to talk about with hardware. Yep. Um, let's move on to gameplay. Yeah, so here's the concept that we originally pitched to Vroom, uh, where you basically have these people throwing orbs, Mario Kart style, from behind 
um, from behind the player. And so uh, what they actually see on the screen is kind of something that looks like this. And we figured everyone knows how to play Angry Birds by this point. So we went with the slingshot idea and that you could fling orbs kind of up. And it was actually really cool to see the orb fly off the top of the screen and then like show up in the game right in front of you. So that was that was a kind of a really cool, um, I don't know, it worked out better than I thought it would. Yeah, definitely. I, it was a big hit with everybody. Uh, so these are the breakdown of the orbs and uh, we're gonna explain each and every one of them um, in a little bit of detail. Uh, it, it's basically kind of reminis reminiscent of the whole Mario Kart effect. Um, and so we have good orbs and bad orbs. So you really have a morality thing going with your friends where it's like, oh, is, is this guy going to be throwing all bad orbs at you and wanting to hinder you? Or do they want to help you out and help you get the best score possible? Yeah, so you could kind of team up and get a good score or not. Um, so I'll let Jeremy take the good orbs. Yep. So uh, our first orb is Tailwind. And this is a little difficult to see. But basically what we have going on when you hit a Tailwind is um, it, it's basically just a speed boost, kind of like a mushroom. and. Uh, in Mario Kart, and we also pan the camera back and change the field of view to kind of have a little tunnel vision effect um, when going through, so it looks like you're actually going really fast. Um, this also makes the, you know, some of the good orbs are not always all good. Um, if you're going around like a tight corner, you don't want to be hitting a tail, a tailwind, because if you hit, um, if you hit the walls, you're going to be losing points. Um, the second one is the shield. This is much like the star in Mario Kart. We, we obviously took a lot from Mario Kart. Um, what this will do is if you hit walls with the shield, uh, you will not lose any points. You won't lose your multiplier. Um, and then if you hit bad orbs, those will just go away. So the shield acts like a really good lifesaver in some situations. Uh, the third one is leaves. And basically when you pick this up, um, you can, there's five leaves that are thrown out on the track. And as long as you stay in the direction that the leaves are going on the track, you'll, uh, for each leaf, you'll actually get your multiplier back up again. So if you just hit a wall, you just lost all your, your multipliers, you can then hit those leaves and, and get multipliers back. And then uh, we'll jump on to my favorite ones are the bad orbs. First one is the obstacle or tumbleweed orb. Um, it didn't used to be the tumbleweed orb. No, we'll explain a little bit about that later. There was a tragedy that occurred, um, and we'll get into that. But these aren't your typical tumbleweeds that you would actually like just run over with your car when you're driving down an LA freeway or something. They're chemically enhanced tumbleweeds. They are. If that makes any sense. It's more like hitting a deer with your car. Yeah. Um, so Even they, the sound effect has just a very heavy like thump. When you so hit them. when you hit the orb, there's checkpoints further up along on the track, and so when you hit those checkpoints, it'll place three tumbleweeds in front of your car on that track. So you have to kind of avoid them. Uh, the second one is icy road. And as you can see, the wheel kind of bowing out here, um, it actually really hinders your control mechanism. We actually make it feel the car much more slippery um, and kind of slide around a little bit more. And then the last one is kind of the opposite of the tailwind, which is heavy load. So the camera actually zooms up really close to you, and you actually um, go slow really down significantly. Yes, absolutely. So let's actually get into kind of the post-mortem part uh, of, of the game. So talking about kind of what worked, um, so I'll let you take the art pipeline. Yeah, so uh, if anybody's familiar with 3D graphics, um, this is the 3D Studio Max logo. Um, one thing that we talked about at the beginning of the project with our artists, we had about four, um, is uh, what tools to use and whether they should be using consistent tooling because um, ultimately we made the decision to be using OBJs uh, as our file input for the game to drive the 3D models and textures. Um, so one thing that we did right was decide on one tool and make all of our artists use that. And it did, it did take a little bit of money and investment to make sure all of our artists were covered with the right tools, but this allowed us to basically, uh, this allowed the artists to basically work on their own, use, um, use Max's own uh, merge tools, because they have custom merge tools for all of their files, and uh, they, were allowed, they were able to work on the same file, uh, our, our full environment, uh, concurrently and being able to merge stuff back in, and they were able to collaborate together without really having us deal with some of the headaches that could happen when we're trying to merge OBJs or source files or yeah. anything like that. One, uh, one of the things in, in previous games that we'd worked on, uh, the artists that we were working with um, couldn't actually directly put art into the game. Um, and so normally they would hand the art, you know, the model or whatever, to a developer, and then the developer would have to integrate that art into the game, which is kind of, because I 
obviously work on a Mac and <laughs> 3DS Max and my, I'm not, that's not my thing. Yeah, so one of the keys, although this project was short, we, we banged this out a little, we banged this whole project out um, from pretty much like pre-production to, to gold master yeah. in a little under two months. And so the, the main goal for the art pipeline was uh, Nate and I as the only programmers, we don't have time to be integrating art. Um, and so very early on in the project, we just made a simple, um, not not super like elaborate yeah. solution, but something simple enough to where the artist can kind of work on their own separate from us. So them getting art in the game, being able to replace assets from builds, having the build server, which we'll explain a little later, um, allowed them to update their art and commit it um, when it's ready. Right. Instead of them committing an art asset and then like recommitting after a build came down, they could actually very rapidly iterate on art and then only commit the final asset when it's you know been fully vetted. So, uh, one of the other things that we did really really right um, is so we showed you the production wheel, but in development we had this fantastic hardware that we were working with. And so you notice the G27 has some really cool features, like it has these red buttons on the steering wheel and it's got a gear shifter. So what we ended up doing is uh, when you were basically testing the game, each of these red buttons threw an orb from behind you as if someone was on the, you know, the, the developer machine that you're working on was not necessarily always next to the machines where people are throwing orbs or even in the same state at some point. Yep. So having this wheel that you could actually throw bad orbs at yourself was kind of interesting. Um, but more, one of the interesting things we did is we, with the gear shifter, um, there were six orbs, six effects, and when we were trying to tweak the physics of an effect, we actually could shift into the effect of the, uh, into that actual effect. So each one of the gears uh, was tailwind, heavy load, and yeah. all those different and things. those happen kind of indefinitely until you shift out. So I could just shift into tailwind and ride the whole thing. And get of, a really crazy score. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So that was actually something we did really well. Um, one of our key things that we did, though, um, was agile iteration. And so we'll kind of we'll kind of jump in here. We got some videos of all of our sprints, and our sprints were uh, our goal was to actually get um, the game to gold master, you know, our thing we're going to install two weeks before we fly to Detroit. So any critical bug fixes or changes or any of those things that ultimately inevitably did come up, yep. um, we could actually have time to work those in and not be kind of going to the wall. Yeah. And so the client uh, Vroom was really really um, they they really liked feature creep, basically. And so they would ask us even last minute to start putting things in. So being able to iterate quickly was definitely key, and that um, that reflected in our code base and how we did art and stuff like that. So here's sprint one. This is the first um, this is the first demo that we showed our client, and this was within like a week, I guess. I, re I really dig the checkerboard pattern. Yeah, the yeah. checkerboard pat the, the checkerboard color of, of the, the room box, box is yeah. very, very excellent choice. Make sure the brakes work. Yeah, you gotta very important. Twice, <laughs> and so um, this is basically just sh showing off um, a car driving on a track. This took just like a a week to get up, uh, and basically with maybe like one programmer. Uh, yeah. Like Nate was dealing with a lot of the business side, getting the artist set up, and I just went to town on this. Um, and the one thing to note about this is the art asset that Vroom gave us was, uh, it actually was kind of a funny story. The art asset they gave us um, was incredibly well detailed. And we handed that to our artists and they were like, holy cow, like, this is an insane amount of detail in this, uh, in this game, um, or in this car. And the reason why was because it ended up being a 3D scan of the physical car. And so the, the car that we got was 3.5 million polys. Um, seeing as how the entire scene itself max out at around 800,000. We basically spent a week and a half um, trying to get, uh, I, I know what, look, you can see the complexity in the room box. Yeah, yes. All I those mean, it checkers is. are very, very complex. Yeah, 3.5 million, that, you know. But yes, in reality, reducing the car down to that size was a big task, and so back in sprint one, we actually had that car in there and in the game, and, and Vroom was really, really excited to see that yeah. uh, work being done within a week. Now you'll see it's hard. It may be hard to see, but it looks kind of like there's static on here. So our artist took a little bit too much. Um, he used a tool called Crazy Bump and made it way too bumpy. So the road actually looks like it would destroy your car. Yeah. Um, and, and destroy really your eyes too. Not I think to the mention, artist loved specularity a little we, too much. We learned really early 
that the, the, the road, making uh, normally what you do to make a track is you kind of lay out a path and then extrude the path into a flat uh, piece. The problem is when our artist did this, you can notice the road's actually quite slanted. And it's incredibly difficult to keep the car in the center of the road because the gravity would actually pull the car down on the slants of the road. So, so one of the biggies with, with these car physics is we wanted to, uh, well, Vroom wanted us to never really have this car flip out and do anything crazy. I mean, it needs to stay grounded. Like, the last thing you want in an auto show is your, you know, your flagship vehicle, like, skidding across the road upside down. M much um, like this. Much like this. Um, so I just want you guys to know car physics are really, really difficult, um, especially when you're doing hills and, and kind of those other things that can get quite, quite difficult. Um, you'll see I, I lost control of the wheels there because um, they weren't on the ground. <laughs> so um, this is actually our console. Uh, our in-game console, you're able to just set up commands. We'll talk a little more about that. Well, that was pivotal because we flipped the car like every All 20 seconds. Yeah. So and then uh, a week later, we had sprint three. Um, our artists, we basically said this, this road is actually kind of impossible to drive. So this actually is a, a version of the final track uh, itself. There was no geometry around the track. All this is is the track in a skybox, and there is there actually is walls on the side that you can collide with so you can't fly off the track. Um, but yeah, that was kind of our, our iteration. This is the, the sleek black color of the room box. We call it the stealth. Um, it's really difficult to see there. but. Uh, as you can see, the road is actually flat, um, even around the curves. And the way our artist actually figured out how to do this uh, very efficiently is he actually created just all the sections of the track and made sure they were perfectly level and all the curves. And then like Legos just kind of put them all together and made the final track. Mm -hmm. um, so like, and these hills are nice and smooth. Um, one of the problems we ran into in the previous build is it, it was kind of hard to see, but as you were going up geometry of a hill, it would kind of go it, 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 and like the back and the suspension would bounce as you're like driving yeah. up this hill because you know the verts weren't real smooth. Yeah, that there wasn't um, because the way 3D was in alpha, there wasn't a, an excellent spline implementation yet. I believe there is one in there now. Yeah. But so we had to actually use um, uh, polygon-based physics for the road instead of what uh, typical driving games do with a with a spline. really nice spline-based implementation. And you'll notice the road looks really really nice. Um, I I lay claim to that because I basically said I want the road from Cars. You know, after he paved that road. So I actually went and bought the DVD of Cars and like went to that exact scene and showed him <laughs> exactly what I wanted. And it looks really nice. And then uh, one week later, uh, we actually did a full blocking pass of the landscape. Um, and so you'll see nothing's actually textured yet. Um, so it's kind of this weird, odd zebra wonderland. Uh, but we actually have the geometry in here. Um, one of the things that we found with this pass was there was a lot of geometry that was you know, multiplied. So you see it gets a little bit choppy here, and that's because, well, uh, one of the main problems, and we'll explain this uh, in more reflection in detail, but the problem was instancing. And basically with instancing, like, let, let's use the Flash library as an example. You, you have a symbol in your Flash library, and you use it multiple times, and that saves on, um, that basically saves on throughput and bandwidth when wanting to sort through your display list. Well, the same thing happens in 3D. You have a scene graph with multiple objects in there, and to be able to calculate what kind of polygons to send to the GPU, you, you basically need to do these kind of scene graph uh, filtering calculations. And so um, we didn't have a really good uh, instancing support for our tools. So basically, you know, all of this geometry is completely static, meaning um, the CPU has to analyze over all of the geometry and decide what needs to be sent to the GPU every frame. Um, yeah, so when you have a lot of stuff on the screen, it can slow down. Yep. That's, that's the basic premise. We also had a couple of issues with throwing orbs uh, early on because we wanted the orbs to actually bounce off the walls and land. And our first few attempts at orbs, yeah, you can see it's chugging right there. Um, as you, as you kind of uh, throw an orb, it would kind of hit the wall and bounce and land on the track. But what would happen is it would kind of hit the wall and then fall straight down. And so the orbs would be on the left and right side. Yeah, yeah, they're kind of thick. So we, we made some changes to orbs to uh, basically make them bounce off the walls sooner and also uh, tweak a little, make some hacks for positioning with the orbs so they would mostly you know, end up in the middle. And so this is the, kind of the, a little extended video of what we showed. Yeah. Um, 
earlier. And so this is this is our sprint five. So here comes the master. tumbleweed. Whee. And so that actually hurts his economy meter down here in the corner. So you can see we then added textures and unwrapping. Um, also, take note that the windmills were actually spinning. That was actually really, really difficult to accomplish uh, with what we had built. Again, because we didn't have any editors or tools or anything like that, and we needed um, kind of a, an idea of instance windmills, we, we um, basically had to write a script in, uh, in Max. Max script, yeah. Yeah, we had to write a Max script that exported the windmill positions, and then I basically pulled out the 3D model and did some random, you know, animation. Because, you know, one of the goals, one of the pluses is we were able to make a lot of compromises in this game, and therefore we were able to deliver it quickly. And one of those was we don't need an animation system. We're just using car physics and just the environment. So it's like, cool, no character animation, no IK, no, none of that. And so... Um, but when we wanted to animate the windmills, that became a little more difficult. Yeah, because you're working in three dimensions, and so even though the artist would put a windmill, like, you know, X, Y, and Z coordinates, like, making sure that they matched up was incredibly difficult. Um, and there's... This is chugging a little bit because you were recording. This was... I was recording this. There was a couple of things that's different about this than what was in production. Uh, one, this was recorded on my laptop, so it doesn't have a really great uh, kind of beefy compiler, so you'll have... or beefy GPU in it. The other thing is you'll notice that in the in the distance, the lines actually get blurry. Yep. Um, and the reason for that is uh, there's no... So currently right now, uh, the filtering algorithms available at stage 3D, um, there's no uh, anisotropic filtering support yeah. in there. So what we actually did is um, in like NVIDIA's control panel or API's control panel, you can, um, you can enable that filtering to be done on the GPU for for every texture. And so we ended up doing that because that was at no cost because we had such a beefy machine on the computer. Yeah. Uh, we were able to make these lines less blurry and straight. Yeah, so they were actually sharp all the way into the distance, yep. which was looked much better. Um, yeah, there's the tumbleweed. But the car didn't flip. Yep, did so not flip. That was, that was tricky. Um, so, and it really kind of hurts your economy meter when you really run over tumbleweed. Um, so in the distance, yeah, it, it, they were nice and sharp. Um, and that was actually one of the big wins, we just figured, hey, force it. But that doesn't really translate very well to uh, like web-based GPU type stuff because you're not going to tell every person playing your you know, stage 3D game on the web to, hey, go into your NVIDIA settings, make sure your driver's updated, and you know, update this file. So that's what worked with our agile um, giant sheet process and our sprints. We were able to iterate quickly. Obviously, in between all of these were just different feature requests. And so um, we were able to get those done. Another thing that, that worked was just reload constants. And I'm sure all of you guys know, as uh, game developers, you have a number of constants that are going to be, it's funny because you call them constants, but they're going to be constantly changing during your game development process. Um, you're going to be just tweaking little values. And so r rather than have that in code, um, we, we wanted our game designer to be able to, or anybody really, artist or game designer, to be able to tweak these values um, with, a, with an actual build of the game and not really have to set up their whole Flash environment and compile the whole game and wait for all that to start up. So we created this constants file that uh, you can open up and you can basically tweak any aspect of the game. It's cool because uh, what we did is we basically, we basically exposed the whole, uh, whole Smash framework. So what you could do is you could call any game object currently in the game. You can call any manager currently in the game. Um, Basically, any, any, any public variable that is exposed in code, you could actually address here exactly. using the constants file. Yep. And so, but the really cool thing about this is you could actually get to a point in the game and then pressing, we had a hotkey command in the console which just reloaded the constants file and reapplied all the values. Yep. So you could actually get to a point in the game, like there was one point where there was a big hill that we actually had to, to really spend some time tweaking the physics. And instead of actually tweaking code, recompiling, getting back to that spot, the game de designer just set his car at the bottom of the hill and then kept tweaking these things and changing it until he could finally clear the hill. So these are just live constants changes in game, which really helped our workflow, allowed us to really iterate as quickly um, as we could. And we had any everything in there from scoring to lighting, lighting to yeah. post-processing uh, HSL effects. Yeah, that was actually a really interesting uh, issue that we ran into was, uh, or and things as well, like atmospheric fog, but there's a lot of things that affect the color of the game. And so 
the artist had to figure out how to get that green of the landscape to look like the green from the mock-up. Yep. And so he actually, we used a, a hue, saturation, and lightness filter, an HSL filter, to actually tweak the values to figure out exactly how he could get it to match what was on his, what it was on the mock-up. And then he took those back and then re-exported the material to match that. Yeah, and so, yeah, if you guys are interested in that shader that I wrote, that's actually in the Away 3D Core now, so you can do some cool post-processing movie type effects um, similar to what people do in post-production video. The one problem that we ran into, at least with Away 3D at this moment, when was... Yeah, when applying a post-processing filter um, in Away 3D, it completely eliminates um, anti-aliasing. So we ended up um, going the hard route and manipulating every single texture just so we can maintain that anti-aliasing. Yeah, make it look nice game. and sharp. Yep. Uh, the console was another thing. So we have a couple of videos where we kind of show this, but uh, this is actually just built in, it was built in Push Button Engine. I actually wrote it. Um, and it was built in, uh, it's in Smash. It's in Smash. There's also an open source implementation, or I mean, a, a kind of, somebody pulled the console out into its own implementation called Tilde Console. Uh, I would recommend, if you guys are building anything, whether it's a game or an app, especially games, grab Tilde Console or grab Smash and ju even just for the console because it, it's, it provides such huge wins. It's fully programmable, meaning you can put in your own console commands. You can hook up hotkeys to them. And so it, it allows you to just tweak whatever you want to call whatever you want in game uh, just by hitting the Tilde key and having a console in there. Absolutely. Um, and, and for our international viewers, you can actually program it to a different hotkey. Oh, because yeah. not everyone has a tilde not key. Not everybody has a tilde key, yes. <laughs> so next thing we want to show is uh, how we actually debug the physics in the game. Um, so this kind of shows a little bit of what we did in the console, but you'll see I'm actually, you know, I can type help and it gives me a list of my commands, and then I can say toggle, and then I can hit tab to autocomplete the commands in the console. So I just toggled on physics debugging, and then also unlocked the camera uh, so that it would actually, instead of follow the car, it would actually just be a free-floating camera pointed at the car that I can move around. So one of the things we actually we actually experimented with a lot in the game is like what what's the best uh, what's basically the best shape to represent the car in the physical world and how it collides with the track and, and all those things. And so we started with something that looked like two hockey pucks with a rectangle, so like yeah. or tuna cans that were next to each yeah. other, um, and that. That ended up being really bad for... Because it had hard lines, basically. Yeah, hard lines around the, the bottom edge. And yep. so when you try to go up a hill, you could actually like clip the geometry on the hill and flip front end, you know, end over end, <laughs> trying to go up or down a hill. So this was one solution, which was the pontoons. And this worked out pretty well, but it wasn't yeah. exactly where we wanted it. Yeah. And so we ended up with a solution that's kind of between... No, it's, it's, we have two giant pontoons in our... Oh, do we? Yeah. Okay, but, we ended up with the pontoon. Yeah, so. with the rounded edge, not a flat edge. One of the problems we also ran into is if you would go up and drive against the wall, um, you could actually, if you had a sharp edge there, you could clip the wall and just completely spin out. Yep. So this actually allowed us to kind of like glance against the, uh, the wall without actually, you know, destroying uh, the physics or making sure that it felt right. Yep. So we spent a lot of time on physics. So, so... One more thing that worked is uh, build servers. We, we basically used uh, Jenkins, and I'd re again, just as much as console, I'd recommend having a build server, even in your small projects. If, if there's any sort of collaboration with your project, having a build server is really, really nice. Um, have, may, basically uh, hooked this build server up to Dropbox, so we had a Dropbox for our clients and a Dropbox for our artists. Our team, and, yeah. So and our team, and we basically had, like, our artists had the very latest. It was like, oh, I fixed a bug. Now you can put this art in the game, right? And it basically built in the build server and threw it in their Dropbox. So they had the latest build. And uh, for, for clients, we used Dropbox to automatically stage certain releases for the clients, like you saw in our sprint. Yep. And so um, Dropbox provides a really, really powerful way uh, and simple way to basically throw your build artifacts into something that everybody can share, yeah. All right, so it wouldn't be a post-mortem if we didn't talk about how we screwed up. Yeah. Uh, this picture is from the Detroit Auto Show, and I don't know if you can see my face there or not, but it really depicts, this is a picture the client took and sent to me, but uh, I was exasperated uh, with, I think this exact moment was, there's actually a camera up above, and we take a picture of you while you're driving um, to create like an artifact postcard, kind of like uh, the Buzz Lightyear ride at Disneyland. Yep. that you can have emailed to you. And the funny thing is, during the installation, this is where things in the physical realm just get real screwy. Yeah. There were black curtains between all of the uh, booths, and the, there was a Porsche booth directly behind this, 
And so when the show opened up to the press, they removed the black curtain, and immediately in the camera, was in the top left and right, was the r giant red Porsche logo on these black and glass room, windows. And Room obviously didn't want the Porsche logo in yeah, their, in their artifact. So we very, very quickly um, just software change and, and uh, well, actually, we tried to adjust the camera and snapped it off of its thing. Yeah, so it's that like, wasn't fun. Got duct taped in there. But uh, yeah, that was really screwy. Let's talk about software. What didn't work so well, Nate? Using alpha software, um, it was the best that we had at the time, but it, it added a lot of, we, we found that we had to use a lot of our time fixing um, bugs in away 3 d which we contributed back, and it's a fantastic tool to use now. And now that it's in release, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's a very, very good framework, and we would recommend using that for but on any a, page 3D. But on a two-month project, it kind, kind of caused a little bit of headache. Yep. I, I, I'm going to say that we spent 70 to 80 percent of our time on physics and collision. Yeah, it really sucked because we were the only two programmers, and you know it would have been nice to have like a dedicated like physics dude that would be like, oh, I know what to, I know what to do with this, and I know where to take this, and I can spend you know these weeks like putting it together. Um, but obviously, we didn't have that um, right. convenience, so it was you know going back and forth. But oh, the physics doesn't work the way I want it. Oh, the physics doesn't work the way I want it, and that that took up a lot of time. Yep, uh, OBJ files uh, was a real big hindrance for us. Um, th everything from being able to add lights to the scene, um, our load time, because OBJ is actually a text file, and so it, I think on our load, took about 10 seconds in production, and you actually, since it wasn't asynchronous, you actually had to like freeze on a still frame before we actually loaded. Well, and because the OB, because we had static geometry instead of instancing, and this is where, where it really comes into play, is all of those 800,000 polys or whatever are all defined in this like one uh, OBJ file. So it's just like this massive OBJ file that needs to be loaded in like, honestly, like profiling, like most of our time was like spent in like Flash's split string function. To parse um, the OBJ. To, to parse the OBJ and to load up. Uh, now there was no 5.1 sound in Air Desktop, and this was a boo-boo on my side where I actually went and hired a 5.1 sound mixer to actually do like a full, like, cause the actual, the actual booth had 5.1 speakers built into it. Um, but I didn't realize as I was looking through the profile when it said 5.1 sound and flash um, was only for TV version of Adobe Air and not the desktop. Yeah, we, we really talked early in the uh, discovery process of this that we wanted like when somebody throws an orb to have like the, the feeling the surround sound, sound. like a woo, like over your head. but. We weren't able to do that. Didn't happen. Uh, there's no stage video in air. So we had this attract loop that would play uh, for a person to come up. And uh, that was just something I just didn't under, like not didn't understand, but I thought it would be in there because it was in the browser and it would just be in there and actually wasn't at the time. Um, it wasn't a huge problem for us. Um, it just, because it was a dedicated machine, but that was something that was, yep. uh, we actually couldn't get the video to loop perfectly because when it got to the end, it would, you know, it would, have a little bit of a hiccup. So limitation of regular video and flash. Yeah. So this is great. Um, the biggest thing that we ran into is we didn't have enough time for analytics. Um, that was one of the that was one of the biggest post features that Vroom asked of us is like we want to see how engaging this experience is. Obviously we have people on the floor seeing it, but we want to have actual data of like how long people stay, how many people bow out. Um, how many people just walk by and turn the wheel to start it and then like see it moving in and How like, many run people away? are using the secondary screens whenever somebody is playing? Um, so hopefully maybe in future things there will there might be future prospects for adding in analytics. Absolutely. Okay, now here's a couple of funny things that happened. Um, first of all, you'll notice this was a, our original mock-up, um, and I think it's gorgeous. You'll notice one of the things that's in there is there's shadows. There isn't actually shadows in the game. That was a thing that we couldn't Another get. technical limitation. Technical limitation that was due to the alpha nature of the software. Um, but the problem is this road, although it looks really, really kind of nice and smooth, is really, really narrow. So driving kind of became something like this when we actually implemented a really narrow road. Yeah, so if your car ever spun out, you would be in this hell of trying to scoot you know, in and the out. 72 back turn, the road. trying to get out, especially with the broom box and its sleek, um, Cubular design. Yes. So when we actually implement it, you notice that the road is actually really, really wide. There's two parts playing here. The road is actually much wider than it was, plus the field of vision on the camera it, uh, gives it that kind of effect. But you'll notice we're actually losing a significant amount of arc um, here versus when you're looking over a hill, you can kind of see out over the landscape. 
So we told you that we'd talk about um, the tumbleweeds. And basically, the tumbleweeds weren't always tumbleweeds. They were sheep at one point. Once upon a time. But as you guys can see, these are kind of like paper mache, cute, cutesy sheep. They're, they're not real sheep, right? Um, so what we had was uh, you'd hit a sheep orb, now the tumbleweed orb, and these sheep will pop up on the road. And if you run into them, you lose points, obviously. And they have this really hilarious, I mean, they were like buying. They would, they and would they'd, bleed at you when you hit and them. And they have this really just like nasty sound when hitting them. And, um, and we, spent, we spent a lot of time trying to get the sheep to work right. Yes. And then at the last minute, like a week before, they're like, oh, take the sheep out. We don't want our car hitting livestock. So that was an example of some feature creep is like, oh, yeah, a week before, like take out the sheep, your favorite part of the game, and put yep. in uh, tumbleweed. So now we can uh, move on to questions here. Um, and that's our contact information at the bottom. Yep. Run, Colin. I think everyone's just in awe. Oh, yeah, back there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hi. So you uh, you said uh, OBJ was a plus because it was standardized on it from the tool set, but you also said OBJ was too biased because it's super slow to load. So what would you, if you were doing this the next time, what would you have picked as the alternative? I'll talk about that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, OBJ, um, yeah, as far as the plus and the standardization of the tool set, there's also a bunch of minuses with that. Like, for instance, something I, I didn't talk about so much was how much we actually had to modify the OBJ parser in uh, the way 3D um, or alpha um, because there's so many discrepancies with how editors export OBJ because it is it is a pretty massive format, so it could it's be a, a headache to support everything. Yeah, it's a and standard, but there's different implementations of it. Yeah, it, it's yeah, it's a standard kind of sorta. And so Max will export all these weird things. Like uh, one thing we didn't talk about is materials. I had to um, write in a lot of special uh, op codes, basically in um, uh, in the parser for OBJ to be able to accept uh, materials that would be exported from Max. And so. The, the, the main minuses from OBJ were really like the, those standards. It took a lot of time to write, uh, rewrite the parser, as well as um, just the file size in general. It's all, it's all ASCII, so it's just like it you compresses know, real well. It compresses real well, but it um, to parse it, it just takes forever. So going going with the binary format would have been a huge plus, but it could, that also has its own drawback. So, so away 3D does have their own binary format that they're working on and called it's AWD. Excellent. And if you, um, uh, th their tools have been maturing in that, and we wanted to embrace AWD, but we just, uh, at the time, it wasn't mature enough for us. So there was the, the tooling wasn't there, so yep. we just couldn't couldn't do it at that time. It's gotten much better since yeah. end of last year. Yep. Questions. So, quick question: What do you get? What made you guys chose uh, Away 3D first of all as as a framework? Uh, the open source nature was a really big thing for us, um, mostly because we ended up having to modify the code significantly uh, for some of our specific needs. Um, and it was actually really cool that we could contribute a lot of that back uh, to people for those things. Um, it was also, I think, the most um, at the time, kind of the most mature um, had. It had pretty good support. Like we, we know some of the guys at Away 3D, so it was only a matter of like calling somebody up to get some answers on some things, which is um, always a plus. And so, uh, yeah, like I guess the state of uh, 3D engines at that time, back in September, October, was just like as far as a, a stage 3D support was kind of like hit or miss. And so, um, well, and then one of the big things is they had Away Physics built in, which had a vehicular physics um, It's model. basically a bullet physics alchemy port. Yeah. So um, that, that was also a big plus, yeah. Yeah, ended up being a hindrance near the end, though, in retrospect, but yeah. yeah. And a uh, really quick question either. So like, uh, for a game in something like that scope specifically, which is not a very used project, would it be like easier to be done, for example, in Unity? That is an excellent question for a Flash Gaming Summit. I know. Yeah, that's <laughs> the thing. I'm just like finding, trying to find like, um, arguments. 
I very, I very much like Unity. Um, it, it's very much like an acquired taste. Some people will like it, some people will hate it. Some people will really like the tooling workflow, others would like to fire up and use their own architecture. So Unity is very focused, um, which is good and can really work for some products. Um, whereas uh, Flash and Stage 3D kind of like you have like a main source file and you basically choose the architecture that you want. So not, not only that, but also um, there, was a, there was a business discussion that happened early um, as to taking the game and actually putting it on Broom's website mm -hmm. as a kind of a, you know, a playable online game. Um, and that actually would be a very easy path. Uh, it, and actually at the end, we actually, it was really simple. It took a few hours to get a build running on the web just by swapping out file screen for URL loaders. Yeah. And um, the only thing we would yeah. have to do to really make it viable on web is then change the format from OBJ to more binary format, yep. switch over to using some instancing and things yeah. like that. Cool. Thank you. Over here, Colin. We're really making you run. <laughs> Thank you. Um, did you ever have difficulty relaying like technical specifications or like limitations to your clients? And uh, if so, um, like how did you overcome that? Broom was really awesome. They were probably one of our favorite clients we've ever had. Yeah. They um, they kind of let us do our own thing, and so technical requirements wasn't really something that I think really came up. They were more, um, they were more focused on the art style, the user experience, and we, we had a dedicated kind of user experience we slash did. art team lead that really worked with the client a lot, um, but there was no distrust with like the technical stuff that like Nate and I could churn out, and so we, a lot of the development was focused mainly on that user experience, so it's like, you know, asking the client, well, do you really, really want shadows? They did want shadows, but over that, they wanted a fun game, and they wanted, you know, they wanted something that's engaging in their booth. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. Any other questions? I think that's it. Are we done on time? We good? Yep, you're on time. Thank you guys. Let's hear it for Nate and Jeremy. Thanks, Thanks very everybody. much, guys. For those of you who are here at Triple Door, uh, you notice food starting to come out, so you'll probably want to stick around for lunch. Uh, for the folks online, we'll get started.